Right now, you might be watching this video distracting yourself from those emails you said you'd get around to doing. And perhaps later you feel guilty for your lack of focus. Well, don't beat yourself up too much. There's a scientific reason for your distractibility. A study carried out by scientists at Princeton University and the University of California, Berkeley, concluded that our brains refocus our attention four times every single second. Well, uh, our brains have limited processing resources, meaning that we can't simultaneously process all the information in our complex environment at the highest level. Instead, the brain has developed a collection of mechanisms that determine which aspects of the env environment should receive preferential processing. And this collection of mechanisms is referred to as attention. My name is Ian Fiebelkorn. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist at Princeton University. The mechanism of attention that is most often studied is spatial attention, where we boost the processing of a specific location. That's the process our brains go through when we, for example, walk into a room at a party. There's an enormous amount of information in this space, lots of people, their faces, clothing, where they're standing. The list is endless. We are phenomenally good at processing this data, but not all at once. Our brain sifts this information into levels of importance. What we need to know now, what can wait till later, and what can be dismissed entirely. Spatial attention has often been compared to a spotlight that continuously scans the environment, uh, stopping or pausing to illuminate behaviorally relevant aspects of the environment or locations. The classic view of spatial attention or this metaphorical spotlight uh, is that it, the strength of that spot spotlight is continuous. However, our work has shown that instead, uh, the spotlight seems to be dimming four times per second. So when we think we're giving something our full attention, we're still distractible, almost constantly. And so the question is, why would that be? We've proposed that this dimming of our metaphorical spotlight prevents us from becoming overly focused on any single location in the environment. It provides these windows of opportunity when it's easier to disengage from the presently attended location and shift our attention to another location or aspect of the environment. There's a network of brain regions that directs this metaphorical spotlight of spatial attention. Within this network, there's uh, what we refer to as neural oscillations. And so basically, uh, it's, it's like a sine wave, right? There are peaks and there are troughs. And you can conceptualize these sine waves in your brain or these, you know, it's just, it's just a wave, right? The peaks of that are like high excitability states. That means that the neurons are, are really ready to fire. And so if a visual stimulus happens to occur at that peak, when the neurons are ready to fire, you're more likely to detect that visual stimulus. And if it happens instead at a trough, where the neurons are less ready to fire, you're more likely to miss that stimulus. The study shows for the first time that our brains are constantly alternating between two different states, one that is associated with focus and one that's associated with distractibility. Through our evolution, again, you could see how this could be, could be to our advantage, right, in a survival mode where you're, you're out foraging, there might be a predator and you don't want to miss that predator because you're overly focused on the task at hand. But in a modern office environment, those distractions aren't critical to your survival. They're just keeping you from being able to focus on something you need to do. And so something that helped us through evolution could be hurting us in another context. In both our work and personal lives, various technologies are vying for our attention, and the current pandemic has only made this more apparent. In order to do our jobs and continue an active social life, we rely on these devices more than ever. The very thing that was designed to aid our productivity is in fact doing the opposite. And that's no accident. So how have companies optimized products to take advantage of our inherent distractibility? Of course, when it comes to our technology, the same mechanic of, uh, of, of pulling on a slot machine in a casino is also at work when it comes to scrolling a feed. It's the same exact psychology of a variable reward. 
This is Nir Eyal. He's a behavioral designer and best-selling author. His 2013 book, Hooked, advised companies how to make habit-forming products. Six years later, he released Indistractable, which offers a way for those of us who found themselves habitually using a product to take back control. Today, because of the data that is being collected on us as we use these tools, we are manufacturing the products in real time based on the data we give these companies. You are investing in the service, giving it data to customize the experience just for you. For the first time, products no longer depreciate. If you think about it, when, when a consumer buys a product, that product loses value with, with usage, with wear and tear. It depreciates. But habit-forming products should do the opposite. They actually appreciate because they store value the more they are used. So if you think the world is distracting today, just wait a few years. This trend is not reversing. These tools are here to stay, and if anything, the world will become a more distracting place in the years to come. As we have the confluence of more data transmitted at faster speeds and greater accessibility to these tools, that means that if you are looking for distraction, then distraction you will find. So if there's one thing I want people to remember when it comes to distraction, it's that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. So if you have the chocolate cake on the fork and it's on its way to your mouth, it's too late. If you're about to take a puff of that cigarette and the cigarette is lit in your hand, you've lost. If you're sleeping next to your cell phone inches from your bed, they're gonna get you because it's too late. However, there's no algorithm, there's no consumer psychology principle, there's nothing that these products can do that can't be prevented with taking steps in advance. Simple things like turning off notifications, which two-thirds of people with a smartphone never do. Things like changing our, our uh, desktop uh, on our computer to make sure that there's less distraction on our, on our uh, devices. Uh, things like changing distraction in the workplace. We know that as much as we blame technology for distracting us, one of the greatest sources of distraction in the workplace is the open floor plan office. So acknowledging the fact that distraction has been around forever uh, and that people have been getting distracted well before these modern tech tools indicates to us that the source of the distraction is not the technology. That's simply the proximal cause. That's the symptom, not the root cause. The real cause of distraction is that most distraction starts from within us. And our desire to escape an uncomfortable sensation like boredom, anxiety, uncertainty, stress, fatigue, this is the real source of distraction. And if we don't tackle what's called the internal triggers, we will always find distraction somewhere.